السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي خلق الظلمات والنور ثم الذين كفروا يعدلون وأصلي وأسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters in Islam Today in this uh, occasion where we are gathered to think about the destitute and the people around the world who are less fortunate than us is a noble gathering. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds and for what we have gathered here tonight. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you with forgiveness and to unite you with the best of righteous people every morning and every evening. And may Allah make our end the meeting with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hereafter at the fountain which he has promised to meet us at Al-Hawd Al-Kawthar. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the topic has been chosen for me and suggested and I agreed to go with it. They called it the journey to the hereafter. And we thought of having a series on this. Insha'Allah, every now and then when we get together for this occasion, we'll continue part one, part two, part three. The journey to the hereafter. I would like to make a note that I am addressing the Muslims that are here before me. Why do I say this? On a side note. Often my lectures end up on YouTube to the public globally. And there are people who are non-Muslim and people of different backgrounds who listen to this. I'd like everybody to know that when a speaker speaks, he's looking at the people before him. And he is speaking from his heart to their heart. And it is difficult to think about the world around us. So everybody has a different understanding. I'm speaking to you, my brothers and sisters, (coughs) who are Muslims and believers already. Because the belief in the hereafter is something that requires a long journey before someone is able to believe in something which is the unseen. The Muslim who submits to this and has gone through research of finding that the Quran is truly the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally comes to the conclusion that whatever appears in it is therefore from our Creator, the one who originated us from the beginning. We call him Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he has named himself And Allah is the name which is used for any person of different religions, whether they are Muslim or not. The name Allah is very unique and cannot be applied to anything else. Linguistically, it will not make sense for those who know Arabic. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator who originated us. He is beyond this world and beyond the laws of this world which he has created. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this creator who created us, who is not like us in any shape or form and we cannot describe him except in the way that he has attributed himself the Rahman al-Rahim, the most merciful, the giver of mercy. He has informed us about a life beyond this one. A life beyond this one that is yet to come. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he did not create us in this world foolishly, for no reason, purposeless, just like that. No. Allah says in the Quran, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Did you assume or calculate or estimate in your logical mind, which is quite limited in other words, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ In your own calculations which is limited, you came to the conclusion that we created you. And the word we here applies to Allah. It's the we used for language of royalty. We the queen, we the king. Allah says we, meaning Allah. Did you assume and calculate in your limited mind that we created you just out of foolish play and that you will not return to us again? You will not return? That you are to live and that's it? 
and that you live only for this world and then you die and turn into dust in other words this is not included in the ayah but this is what it means that you all as people assume huh? you are created suddenly in this world you will live for a short time and then you will turn into dust and that's it and other people come along and that's how the world runs Allah says this is quite foolish and quite limited in the way people think with the vastness of the universe it is impossible for people to assume or to come to the conclusion or make it a fact that we are just created here for this short time with no originator and nowhere to go after here and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he brings the many ayat in the Quran many verses in the Quran talking about the logical sense of understanding that we came from somewhere and that we have to go back to that somewhere from where you came you will return and then Allah says in for example in Surah Qaf read Surah Qaf and verses like it where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the most eloquent of language about our origin and that how we will return by giving us examples of factual scientific things that we see before our eyes and when I say scientific I meant in the sense that science believes that things that you can reach and see and touch and experiment with and that fit within the laws of nature so Allah gives us the laws of nature and saying to us just like that I will return you back you will come back to me how Allah says in the Quran والقرآن المجيد بل عجبوا أن جاءهم منذر منهم فقال الكافرون هذا شيء عجيب قاف a letter which we don't understand the meaning to yet it has lasted there for over 14 centuries Allah says and by this Quran this Revelation, this book of Allah, Al Majid, the high, the noble, the honorable. It is but them who thought. Who is he talking about but them? Those who debated with the Prophet when he came to them, telling them that you are not to be in this world forever. There is a reason for you to be here, and after this life, you are going to be resurrected and taken to a day of judgment, and then either with your actions it will decide your fate where you will end up so ajibu Allah says they found it extremely strange confusing and ja'ahum munzirun minhum that from among their own people there came to them a warner a warner about what? that they will be resurrected and be brought to life to be questioned about what they put forth before. What did they say? The disbelievers or the people who denied, they will say, or they said, this is something ajib. This is something uncanny. Makes no sense. Illogical. Strange. Far reaching or far from our reach. We cannot understand this. It cannot be true. Allah says, what did they say? أَإِذَا مِتْنَا وَكُنَّا تُرَابًا ذَلِكَ رَجَعٌ بَعِيدٌ They used to say, what? <clears throat> what? Are you saying that as soon as when we die and we have become soil or clay, we become earth, we turn back into whatever we become, decomposed, that we are going to be resurrected after that and we're going to join back in the way we are now after we have turned into something else that which you are calling to that you are going to return back is something far-fetched beyond reasoning brothers and sisters in Islam don't think that people who deny resurrection and hereafter in our 21st century is something new this is old news this is old school People have always said this and said that it is nonsense. Not even just only in the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even before the, the prophets and the people before. Thousands and thousands of years before people have always said this. Then Allah says, 
قد علمنا ما تنقص الأرض منهم وعندنا كتاب حفيظ So Allah responds to them by saying Listen This argument you are putting forth that you will die and be turned into soil and dust decomposed into a different material and different matter Allah replies by saying Do you think that I don't know this? You're putting forth an argument that I am well aware of. In other words, we know exactly what the earth has taken from your matter. The earth has taken from your bodies. We know every single atom that existed in your body, every single material in your body, every single element, every piece of small and big thing that was decomposed and turned into something else by the earth. Allah says, we or I am well aware of every single part of it where it went and how it became. Since I know, Allah says, وَعِنْدَنَا كِتَابٌ حفيظ. In other words, I am, we have a record, a record of it that is secure and everlasting and cannot be changed. Meaning Allah says, I am definite and it is secure and I will always know where everyone ended up and what they turned into. So if you're thinking that I can't bring you back, then I already know exactly where every part of you went into. So a one, in other words, if I know where you came from, what you're made of, and every single part of you where it went, am I not able to bring all that back and bring it back to the way it was before? Since I have full knowledge of it, you can't because you don't know where everything goes. So this is the argument Allah put forth. Brothers and sisters, why am I saying this? The journey to the hereafter is something unseen. And we are always affected by what we see before us. Is that not right? We're affected by things before us. And the evidence to this is that when we work, when we strive, when we create a purpose in our life, we make that purpose to fit what we see and what we can feel before us. The strongest of believers are the ones who live their life as if they are in the hereafter. And as the when the belief goes less, the actions and purpose in life is shown. That's evident. What do you work for in this life? What is your purpose? What is your goal? What do you live for? And that automatically, equally translates your belief and your Iman in the hereafter. Let me give you an example. If I asked you, or if I told you that you are going to die tomorrow, you are going to die tomorrow, and you are certain of that, Let's say that this is true. You're 100% sure tomorrow you're going to die. What will go through your mind? What will you be doing? What will you do? What will you think? For example, will I be thinking about all the prayers that I've missed? Will I be thinking about the zakat which I still owe? Will I be thinking about the debts which I have taken in halal or haram? Will I be thinking about the people who I have wronged? I must make, up, make it up to them. The people I have backbidden. The people I have hurt. The people I have stolen from. Will I be thinking about my parents and what I have brought in shortcoming towards them? My wife and my husband. And my children. My family, relationships. My neighbors. I will think about every shortcoming, the food that I ate, how many people I have known, young people, subhanAllah, that I have known who died and their last death was on a nutrition that was from haram, a money which is from haram, a life filled with a purpose. And if you were to ask them what kind of purpose this is, and they knew that they were going to die the next day, they will respond to you something like this. I cannot afford to die tomorrow. I can't face Allah yet. What kind of thinking would go through that person? Their whole life will change as if they are living in the hereafter. They're going to die tomorrow and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're going to fix their a'mal, their deeds. And suddenly everything that used to mean or used to stress them out of this worldly life 
people who hurt them, for example, people who wrong them, people who upset them, suddenly they don't mean anything anymore. Who cares about it? Right now I've got before me my own deeds and my own self to answer for. Who have I hurt? Who have I backbidden? Who have I upset? Who have I taken the right from? Who have I not given their right to? Where are the rights? I will be thinking about myself, Allah al -Azim. And that belief in the hereafter is what we need. Allah reminds us of it so that we can return. Narja, return. Who knows what the meaning of tawbah is? Anyone? Tawbah? No. Repentance. And the literal meaning of repentance, brother, is what? The word repent means return. Ar-Ruju'ah. Tawbah means to return. Return. Allah SWT is always reminding us, return. Sometimes He reminds us by reminding us of Jannah, things to look forward to, or hellfire, things not to look forward to, all for the purpose of returning. Where have you gone? Return. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah then says in Surah Qaf, talking about the logical reasoning behind our resurrection, and then He says, and we brought down from the sky rain, and from it we created many gardens that you see before your eyes. Plantations and trees and fruit that you eat from. How did that come about? Allah says in the Quran, Rizqan lil a provision for you, for his worshippers. And we brought back to life a dead earth. In the same way, just like that. Just like you see a dead earth come back to life, like that. We will resurrect you and bring you back to life from the earth. Exactly like the way you saw the dead earth bring forth its plantation from beneath it. Allah says, exactly like that as you saw it, we will bring you back from beneath the earth like the seeds grew. So you see it before your eyes. What are you waiting for? Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on after that by telling us about the people before us, how they belied this, how they denied this, how they busied themselves with other things and neglected the hereafter. Then Allah says in the Quran, and surely we have created man. And we know exactly what their insides whispers to them. Your thoughts, the good and the bad. And we are closer to them than their own jugular vein in our knowledge. We know exactly what whispers inside of them. Then Allah says, Behold, without a doubt, if meaning no doubt, and they will not move away from that. There are two angels, one on the right, one on the left, watching over, recording everything, taking note of everything. Qa'id, ala wazni fa'il, which means they are constantly there and nothing can make them move away. When you say something in, in, that, in that sort of sound, qa'id, hasib, jalis, uh, it means that they're always there in, in that way in Arabic that they will never leave there and nothing can make them move from there they are stubborn as stubborn as a mountain is clinging to the earth which it's, with its pegs deep rooted in the ground nothing can make it move Qa'id they are like stern like mountains sitting there they will listen and watch every single utterance and action that a person does in the night and in the day in secret and in open Now. مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Not a single utterance does he utter with, except that there is a watcher over them and one who will bring forth as a witness, saying, he did and she did. What does that mean? These two angels will come on the day of judgment and one of them will say, أَنَا رَقَبْتْ I watched. I not only watched, I constantly watched. Raqib is another, see, Raqib, Atid, Jalis, Qa'id, the same uh, form of, the same sound in Arabic means sternly, 
fixed there. Nothing can make a move. So he says, Raqib, constantly watching. And Atid on the day of judgment will come and say, Ya Rab, he did this and she did that and they didn't do this and they didn't do that and they said this. Constant like that, like a dibi dabba. Constant, constant, constant. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ And so finally, and so finally, in truth comes death. The intoxications of death have truly come to you. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak in that manner? Allah is saying to us as if it's something that is inevitable, will happen to every single person. And there is no need to prove it because in another verse Allah calls it yaqeen. Yaqeen means that which is certain. And no one in the world can deny the yaqeen, that which is certain. No atheist, no Muslim, no Christian, no Jew, no nothing can deny it. Death is death and it will happen to everybody. So Allah says, وَجَاءَتْ سَكْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ And so the intoxications of death have come in truth. Man already knows that death will come. So Allah just tells you, well, it has. And so it came in truth. Now let me tell you as if you were there now. Allah doesn't bother telling you about your life before. He tells you now, let's talk about the end, the reality. This is what really matters. You can go on vacations, you can go on holidays, you can fly in the air, you can, you can go wherever you want. In the end, every single one of us, you and I, will inevitably come to the final meeting's place. What is it? Death. No one can deny it. We will all end up there. Just like every river ends up in the, or comes from the same place and ends up in the same place. This is what you were running away from. Tahid. What does it mean? It means two things. The deniers of the hereafter, they don't want to talk about death. They don't want to talk about the hereafter. They're always trying to avoid its mention. They want to busy themselves with everything that makes them happy in the world. And they don't want to think about what makes them miserable in the hereafter or happy in the hereafter. They don't want to hear about it. They're not ready for that. So this is one meaning. And another meaning is those who do believe in the hereafter, tahid, meaning that this is what you used to fear. Even a normal person fears death. And when, it come, when you say to someone death, obviously they're afraid. It's natural for us that when death comes to us, we try to protect ourselves. Is that not right? Even a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to use preventative measures from things that harm him. But he knew that death is inevitable. This is natural to us. As he said, whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet, Allah loves to meet them. A sahabi said, Ya Rasulullah, and is there any one of us who does not fear death? A Rasul sallam, said, no, 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 this is not what I meant. What I am saying is, this is natural. Everybody fears death naturally. Otherwise, we don't protect ourselves and protect others. However, he says, when a person's time of death comes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the believer fills them with a serenity and a feeling of peace that they feel that they really want to meet Allah and Allah no longer makes them afraid of dying. So then they wish to meet Allah and Allah loves to wish to, to meet them, loves to meet them. And this is the hadith of the Prophet sallam, which says, uh, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a servant or a, a worshipper, may I say, if Allah loves a worshipper of his, Asalahu, he beautifies or makes sweeten or sweetens his death. Meaning at the time of death, you find that they are serene and peaceful. And what they used to fear, they no longer want to run away from it. And then Allah goes on by talking about the resurrection and the hereafter. And he mentions something amazing. He mentions a particular friend or a company that stays with you from the time you were born. He is called a Qareen. A Qareen, again you can see the ala wazni fa'il, Qareen, Jalis, Atid, Qa'id, this pattern, which means that this person is with you, or this thing, this creature is with you, whispering to you, constantly with you, will not leave you, stubborn until your death. Allah creates this jinn or this shaitan with you from time of, of birth until the time of death, and He whispers into you giving you bad thoughts. So Allah mentions that this Qareen, it means two things. The jinn that is with you and also the friends that you have chosen in your life that are always with you and you take them as companions. On the day of judgment, Allah, you will blame them. You will blame them. You will say, Ya Rabbi, 
everything but me. I didn't do it. Do you know how sometimes we have this tendency here in this world where we don't like to be blamed? Isn't that right? We, no one likes to be blamed. Isn't that an ugly feeling when someone blames? I think every single one of us here has been through this hundreds of times where you feel that the criticizers come and they criticize you. They point to something. They blame you, right? How do you feel? Nobody likes criticism or being blamed. But the believer who believes in Allah and, and knows that there is a hereafter, if it is their fault, they will say, it is mine. But the majority of people naturally don't like to be blamed. So on the day of judgment, it, this will be multiplied upon multiplications. When you see hellfire before you and you see that the, the sky has opened up and you see billions and trillions of angels, Allahu Akbar, more than what you can, can count the grains of sand. They will descend and you see that the hereafter is true and what was hidden from your eyes is true. Allah says, لَقَدْ كُنْتَ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مِّنْ هَذَا فَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ you, you were surely before this, في غفلة, in an unknown situation, in a situation of you, of not knowing the unknown. Oblivious of the unknown. And ghafla also means, you know, uh, not paying attention, not caring about what is to come. And now today we release the veil from in front of your eyes, that which covered all this. And so today your eyesight is sharp, you see everything. So the qareen comes. And you don't want to be blamed. So you start saying, Ya Rabb, it's my father, it's my mother, it's my brother, it's my sister, it's my friend, it's my teacher, it's my wife. She says it's her husband. They say it's the children. They say it was the baby that was born. They kept them away from their salat. They say it's the, 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 everything but themselves. And then finally Allah brings all these people. And this is why the father and the mother run away from their children. And the children run away from their father and mother. And the friend runs away from his friend or her friend. And the husband runs away from his wife and the wife runs away from her husband. Naam. On that day, every person will have a matter that they are concerned with. Aisha radiallahu anha said, when the Prophet said, on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, people will be gathered barefooted, naked, as the same way their mothers gave birth to them, the same way they were born. And Aisha radiallahu anha stood up like this, confused, said, Ya Rasulullah, like what everyone would ask. Barefooted, naked, everybody looking at each other. And Rasul sallallahu said, Ya Aisha, Al-Amru ashaddu min an yanzura ba'duhum ila ba'd. Al-Amru yawma idhin ashaddu min an yanzura ba'duhum ila ba'd. On that day, Ya Aisha, the matter is more severe, more serious, more concerning than for anyone to even be concerned about looking at other people's nudity. I'll give you an example in this worldly life so you can get the picture even closer to your mind why this is so severe. Imagine crossing the road, right? I know it's a bit funny, but subhanAllah, there is a serious element to it. You're crossing the road and everybody is either half naked or naked. You're all safe. The first thing you'll be thinking about is looking at all this. But then suddenly someone calls out and says, be careful, a truck. You look before you and about 20 meters away, a semi-trailer is heading straight towards you. And in a matter of about five seconds, it's going to kill you. Now, what will you be concerned about and thinking about? You will think about nothing and all of this around you, it's as if it doesn't exist because your life is at stake and you're only thinking about saving yourself. On the day of judgment, everybody will be thinking about saving themselves. And for this reason, he said, Ya Aisha, the matter is so severe that people will not even be concerned about this stuff. La ilaha illallah. To the point where a person thinks that they are the only one being judged. So they want to take the blame off themselves until finally they say, My Qareen, it's my jinn. He's the one that whispered to me. It's his whispering. So then Allah brings the Qareen. وَقَالَ قَرِينُهُ هَذَا مَا لَدَيَّ عَتِيدٌ And the Qareen will say, 
Oh my Lord, he, uh, he's not in a position to blame me. He's not in a position to blame me. And in another verse he says, I just invited him. And he responded. In another verse, the, the, the Qareen goes to the, to the extent of saying, Inni Allah Rabbil Alameen. I fear Allah, the Lord of the humans or Lord of the worlds. So then what does Allah say? I'll settle it for you, both of you, all of you, everyone who decided to turn away and chose Jahannam as their home, put them in what they deserve. Kafar. Kafar means a person who knows and denies, knows and deliberately denies. They are people who go like this. On the day of judgment, when I see God, I'm going to tell him this, I'm going to tell him that. And that's why I don't believe in him. These are the people who know and deny. Why would they say, oh, when I see God? That means they believe in something. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah knows every human being, every intention. And he's the just. So we can't blame others but ourselves. Until finally, the person reaches a point where they are driven. Either to Jannah or to Hellfire. And they will say, it's our fault. It's our fault. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the journey to the hereafter requires us to think like this. Live as if you are in the hereafter. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam helped us by saying, Kun fid dunya. He said it to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. Kun fid dunya ka annaka gharib. Be in this world as if you are a stranger or a wayfarer. Someone just passing by. Fatuba lil ghuraba. In another hadith, he says, So glad tidings and good news to those who live their lives as strangers. Let me give you an example. This is so much eloquence in this. So much eloquence in this. When you pass by a strange land that doesn't belong to you, and you are just a traveler, you're holding a little bit of material, a little bit of equipment in your luggage. You've only got bare minimum amount of money. You've got a little bit of clothing, a little bit of food. You don't stay somewhere for long. You rent, a, you, you hire a place to stay in for a little while. And then you move on. What is your mentality when you're a traveler? People don't really concern you much anymore. Whether they like you or they hate you, they're strangers. In about a week's time, you're going back home. You don't care. So that's why when people travel, I'll give you this little hint. When people travel, I don't know why, subhanAllah, a lot of them, their iman decreases. Because they think, you know, I don't know anyone. No one knows me. If I do the wrong, no one's going to judge me. I'll go back home. Who cares? Every person has that mentality, Muslim or non-Muslim. They go on travel. They do the haram. They think, oh, what's the big deal? No one knows me. There's no accountability. So they come back. There's no wife, there's no husband, no children. Well, if they have their family, even together, they'll probably go a little bit less in their iman. But if you're alone, the shaitan comes and says to you, you're alone, man, no one cares. Who's going to judge you? This is a person who cares about what people think of them. What I mean by think of them, meaning uh, they do the wrong because people think of them in a certain way. Or they do the right only for the people. What you should be doing is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is watching us in secret and in open. Some people they say, I'm not going to do it for the people. Do what? I'm not going to do the good thing for the people, they say. No, do the good and make it for Allah. And don't do the bad for the sake of Allah. So Rasul said, like a traveler, you don't care what happens. You carry only a little bit and you don't intend to stay. So you don't go, for example, imagine someone going right overseas for about a week or two and decides to establish a career for one week goes and wants to make a career for just one week. I think nobody would want to do that. You establish a career for the rest of your life. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, this life is temporary. And if you go to the cemetery, the other day I went past subhanAllah and I saw a grave and there was a, the date of death on there. 1882, 1900. 1764 and I thought to myself la ilaha illallah wallahi we actually spend more time under the earth than we spend on top of it isn't that right we spend more time under it than we spend over it 
We come out crying from our mother's wombs at birth and everybody else is smiling. And then when we leave the earth, the people are crying for us. And Allahu A'lam, if we will be smiling or crying after that. It all depends on what we put forth in this world, brothers and sisters in Islam. The journey to the hereafter is very important for every one of us because we are all on that journey right now. How old are you? 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. We're nearing now the end, aren't we? Every single day and every single year that has passed is a time out of our lives. We are getting younger. We are growing shorter. We are nearing our death. Sometimes I get amazed when some people, they're working and they look forward to the holidays. So they busy themselves getting miserable and stressed out during the holiday, are waiting for the holidays to come as though the only happiness exists in the holiday time. And I think to myself, La ilaha illallah. All that time that we were miserable and saddened in and stressed out in is time from our life. So therefore, how long do we live? And I'd like to end it with this, insha'Allah. And insha'Allah, next time I meet you, we'll have part two. I want you to think about this ayah in the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَإِنَّ يَوْمًا عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ كَأَلْفِ سَنَةٍ مِّمَّا تَعُدُّونَ And behold, a day to your Lord is like a thousand years equivalent to what you count. If I were to count... 1,000 years of my life. And to Allah it equals a day. How long have I lived for? Or how long do, does an average person live for? Let's say 100 years. Really it's between 60 and 70 as the Prophet ﷺ said, The lives of my ummah are approximately between the 60s and 70s. But let's say 100. If one day to Allah is a 1,000 years, how long have you actually lived for? How much? Jazakallah khairan. 2.4 hours. Take away the sleeping time. One third. Let's say the sleeping time is almost, it's actually, I would say about nearly half. More than a third. So what's left? Hmm? 1.2 hours. Mahak. Take away the time that we uh, entertain ourselves in and just sit around and do nothing, not really, you know, being productive. But if you just take away the sleep, we are left with 1.2 hours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us or requested from us or commanded us to worship Him a little bit of that time. Five daily salat. Each salat takes up five, ten, fifteen minutes, ya akhi. Ma'lish. Fifteen minutes times five is seventy-five. So that's uh, one. No, fifteen minutes each one. It'll be one hour and fifteen minutes if you were to count from that day. That's if you pray your prayer, fifteen minutes each. You've lived for one hour and 20 minutes. Allah has asked you for much less than that of your salat. It equals a few seconds. Maybe one or two seconds of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us for one hour, 1.2 hours of our life, really, to worship Him and in exchange, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us with an everlasting garden. Bliss everything you wish, subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters in Islam, if you were to think about the here after the day of judgment, it is as long as 50,000 years. And Allah extends that day and says, في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة In a day which is as long as 50,000 years. If we were to count in another tafsir that 50,000 years is one day to Allah, do you know how long you've actually lived? One point something seconds. If you were to take away the sleeping time. 
one point something seconds of our lives, Allah asks of us. And we neglect it. You know what happens to that? On the day of judgment when we are resurrected, Allah describes our mentality and what we will be first saying. You know what we first say? They say, Ya waylana, oh woe to us. Man ba'athana min marqadina. And there's a pause. Ya waylana, man ba'athana min marqadina. Who is it that brought us back out of our slumber? And then there's a pause. Marqadina. And you don't take a breath in the ahkam of the Qur'an. You go, مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَ الرَّحْمَنِ وَصَدَقَ الْمُرْسَلُونَ So when, with that pause, it's as though Allah is telling us that on a day of judgment, people will be raised and they're in shock. They say, woe to us, who brought us back out of our slumber? And you're in shock, right? So you don't take a breath. And then you realize something. هَذَا This is what the Rahman, the most merciful, actually told us about and promised will come. And his messengers were truthful. And then people say, كم لبثتم في الأرض عدد السنين? How many years do you think we actually stayed on earth? And then some people start, you know, there's a commotion. And people say, إن لبثتم إلا يوما أو بعض يوم. والله, you just lived. Maybe a day or part of a day. That's what it feels like. And another ayah they say, فَاسْأَلُوا الْعَادِّينَ let's, let's ask the people who have got a better memory than us in calculating. قَالُوا إِلَّا بِثْتُمْ إِلَّا يَوْمًا They will say, you only really stayed but a day. Allahu Akbar! All these years, from the beginning, أخوان, brothers and sisters, you are not, they're not asking about the 60 or 70 years you lived. They are asking about the whole earth's life cycle. The lifetime of the earth. From the beginning of its creation till the end. From Adam and for the humans. From Adam alayhi salam till the end of time. We feel like it's going to be a day. Or it was only a day. And that's when Rasulullah tells us the person, people will say, for a day, for a day I neglected this life. For a day I neglected my Lord. For a day I stole. For a day I looked, I went after a wrong purpose. For a day I backbit. For a day I did this. For a day I fought. For a day I, I did all this haram. For one day? I did all this just for a day? No, not a day. For a second. I ruined my life for a second. Allahu Akbar. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I end up by saying this. Allah talks about people when their death comes, they say the following words. قَالَ رَبِّ رجعون. He, the criminal, the person who has neglected their life, when the time of death comes, they actually know that they're dying. And when the soul is coming out and reaches the godling point, I'll tell you about the thought process. You know what they're thinking? They're saying, Oh, our Lord, please return me. Maybe I will compensate, do some good work instead of what I have left behind. But Allah replies by saying, But Allah will not postpone the time of a person when their death comes. In another ayah he says, It will not be postponed, postponed, nor brought forward a single moment. My brothers and sisters in Islam, live the life with the advice of the Prophet ﷺ, which he said to Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, or was it Abu Dhar? Or was it the man who came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, when will the world end? You know, you expected today a talk about the signs of the last hour. And when the Dajjal will come out and when the world will end. This is what the Sahabi said, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Sa'a, when will the world end? Tell me, tell me, entertain me. Like a movie. For Rasul Sallallahu knew that this person was asking the wrong question. He was after the wrong purpose. So he responded with a question. What have you prepared for it? He's saying, What have you prepared for your sa'a, for your time when your world will end? My brothers and sisters in Islam, prepare for your time. 
and prepare from now. And do not look at the insignificant issues in life. There's something out there that says uh, life is like, or Iman is like uh, going into an aeroplane. I think that's what it says up there. I like that metaphor. The higher the aeroplane goes, the smaller the world looks. And Iman is like that. The higher your Iman rises, the smaller this worldly stuff, you know, these things you get upset about, these things you get annoyed about, the, the smaller they look. A brother said to me the other day, he says, I went and did this and did that for this sick person. Wallahi, never again will I do. I said, why, why are you saying that? He says, it took out a lot from me. Never again. I said, don't say never again, ya akhi. Think about the rewards that you worked for and don't lose your rewards, as Allah says. And do not lose your sadaqat, your acts of charity, by saying words of man, meaning, look what I did, look what I did. I need praise, I need comfort. And then saying words that hurt other people. I did this for you and I did that for you, expecting praise from others. Don't do that. Work and anticipate only the ajr from who? Who's the ajr from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not from people, my brothers and sisters. Not from people. I thank you for listening and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve all the destitute among us and those who are here and those who are around the world from their misery and from their hardships. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings and to make this gathering of ours one that unites our hearts with theirs. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve those who are in oppression from their oppression. Oh Allah, accept our dua. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering in goodness. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruh. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.